Today's scripture reading will be taken from John 13, 4 through 8. 13, 4 through 8. God, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Good evening, everyone. I hope that that uh, PowerPoint did its th its its job. I wanted there to be a delay in that that kind of blurriness there, so that way everybody's like squinting and blinking, maybe. And <laughs> that idea, if you'll turn with me to John chapter nine, being that you know we're going to be talking about this this blind man and how he receives sight. So imagine maybe that's all that he was ever able to see, maybe even less. But uh, yeah, I was hoping that that would kind of provoke a little bit of thought too. Um, so it was intentional. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, uh, thanks for the, the scripture reading too, that the idea of, of Jesus washing and teaching us a lesson, and that's what's going to happen here uh, in, in this parable or in this passage as well. In John chapter nine, we're going to read um, sections of this, uh, this chapter tonight, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit, and hopefully we can glean some information from this. So John chapter 9, starting at verse 1, it says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the man that was uh, the, of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, "Go wash in the pool of, of Siloam, which is translated sent." And so when he washed, he came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors of and those who had previously had seen this man, he was blind, said, "Is this not he who sat and begged?" Some said, "This is he." Others said, "He is like him." And he said, "I am he." And therefore he said to, to him, how were your eyes open? And he answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And so I went, I, I washed and I received my sight. And then they said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. So the first part of this passage, we see that Jesus explains kind of what he's doing. He's answering a question. He's answering a question in, in, in the form of a miracle. This is something that Jesus often did, right? This is something that is, is common to Jesus to show his power over all things whenever he demonstrated his, uh, his miraculous ability to heal. And as we see in this passage, this is a common uh, understanding, kind of a misunderstanding, really, is that when someone is born with some sort of, you know, disease, leprosy or, or blindness or, or they're lame and they can't walk or whatever the case may be, that there's sin. And so they wanted to know who sinned. Who was it that sinned, Rabbi? Who was it that sinned, Jesus? Was it him or his parents that caused this blindness to happen? And so we can go back and turn to Job and read way back when, as well. Job chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. He says, Remember now, whoever perished being innocent, or were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity, iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Kind of, you know, this is Eliphaz talking to Job, saying, you know, these, all this stuff that happened to you, this didn't just happen by chance. There's got to be a reason. What did you do, Job? What did you do against God to deserve all these awful things that happened to him? This was a common misunderstanding. 
Now, we understand nowadays that, you know, it's not the parent's sin that translates onto the children. We understand that. And we know that, that the sin isn't, you know, from the parents. It's not given to the child. The child doesn't inherit sins. A child is born sinless. They're born innocent. But we do know that there are some times that there are after effects. There's, there's things that happen if, you know, say, uh, you know, a, a, a woman is pregnant and she's drinking as she's pregnant. And she becomes regularly intoxicated. What does that happen? What happens? The child can be born with certain ailments. You know, what about you know drugs and all these other things? A, a baby that has developed while their parents were under the influence. Whenever they're born, they have to go through a detox just the same as what the adult would, because those drugs are flowing through that child as well. And they go through the whole process of re, you know rehabilitation as well. They have to go through and be taken you know taken care of. But that's not to say that that child sinned. And this man was born blind. He had been blind from birth. And this is someone that was well known. And it's it's funny to me. Like I wish that you know you could see as this is happening, kind of more more inflection because you know there's all this uh, this talk going on whenever he's, after he's washed that. And that's not, this is, and this is a common practice too, that whenever, you know, who would want to be, you know, uh, marked with clay that had been made out of saliva? That's not a good thing. That, that would not be a fun thing for me anyways. But this was actually a common practice. This was something that they did. And I guess in some instances, it would relieve that pain, re would relieve whatever symptoms perhaps. But I wish that we could see the interactions that took place after this and how he was going out and he after he'd washed and he's on his way back and he's seeing, he's able to see and he, he's, he's walking around and they're like, wait a minute, isn't this the blind man? No, it can't be because he's walking around, he, he's able to see and they're like, no, that's not him. Yeah, it is. That, that's totally him. And he's like, yeah, guys, it's me. <laughs> I was the one that was blind. And it, it's just, it's really cool to see that. And Jesus demonstrates his power over that blindness and, sh and shows that this man here, he, nothing's wrong with him. Sin is not in his life that caused that blindness. It wasn't anything like that. This is, the situation wasn't because of sin, but is so that we, God can be glorified. That's, that's Jesus' purpose every single time is so that we, God can be glorified. And God was definitely glorified in this because he, he, he's able to see all these people are able to also then you know, perceive that Jesus is able to heal this man and God gets the glory in this. But there's an adversity that happens because of this. And we're going to consider that a little bit and, and see that even though this is a good thing, and even though a man is healed from his blindness, someone that they can definitely testify and say, this man has been blind all his life, and all of a sudden now can see, that's substantial. That's a miracle. And they can witness the power of God. And so we see that there's pretty much three different attitudes concerning Christ. So let's pick back up where we left off at verse 13. It says, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Imagine that he just got healed. <laughs> you know, he just got healed from his blindness, and and they're kind of grabbing him up and like, let's go to the Pharisees and see what they have to say about this. But it was a Sabbath day when this happened. Jesus is always kind of he's pushing it on the Sabbath day, and I think by choice. But it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sign. He said to them, "He put clay on my eyes. I washed, and now I see." Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? They're saying, yeah, he, can't be. he can't be a sinner. He can't not be from God because of these signs that he's doing. And so it caused a division among them. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him who opened your eyes? Because he opened your eyes. He said, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, 
Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents, they answered and said, we know not that this is our, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him, he will speak for himself. This is kind of like a, <laughs> they're kind of pushing it back on onto him. They, these Pharisees, they had the ability to throw people out of the synagogue. They had the throw the, the ability to to kind of uh, they were leaders and they could do things. And and these parents seemed to be afraid of what repercussions could happen uh, if they if they answered and said, "Well, yeah, we believe in Jesus as well that he's a prophet." So they kind of it seems as if they're they're a little bit afraid there. And that's what verse 22 says. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, that he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, though, that I was blind and now I see. And when they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He said to them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? That's kind of some tongue in cheek right there. <laughs> you know, like, well, why do you keep asking me about this? Do you want to become his followers too? And then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he's from. The man answered and said to them, why then is why this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began and has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and you are teaching us? And they cast him out. Let's pause there and, and, and kind of read some of these points here. If you can see them, they're kind of small font there. But, you know, the, the class that's represented by the Pharisees, they saw the result of the miracle, but they refused to accept Jesus. Right? They didn't, they didn't want to accept Jesus. This is somebody that they didn't want to accept. They, they saw him as somebody against the, the, the law of Moses. They didn't like the... The, especially that he's performing this on the, the Sabbath day, where you're not allowed to do anything. You're not allowed to work. You're not allowed to do any of these things. And so they were kind of putting on this uh, this extra requirement, this extra law, and they said, this man can't be from God because he's not following the Sabbath. He's not following this command. He's not following one of the Ten Commandments. Even though this is a good thing, and Jesus taught several times about mercy, Right? And how they would have done the same thing. They would have gone out and they would have saved, you know, this a man's goat out of a ditch if it got stuck. They would have gone out and worked on the Sabbath day to have, for mercy's sake. But here, whenever Jesus, all he does is just wipe clay on somebody's eyes and heal some of his blindness. And they're like, you're, you're not from God. You're, you're from the devil. You're, you're able to heal through the, the spirits of the devil. That's how you're able to do this. And they're just completely against him. But how many are, are willing to weigh the evidence contrary to an accepted belief and change if they were shown to be wrong? So in other words, you know, how many times can we show somebody evidence of things and then they still maintain a blindness? They still think, no, I'm, I refuse to see. The choice that they have is that these Pharisees are being shown God's power, and they have chosen to stay blind themselves, even though they are they have witnessed a blind man from birth receive his sight. That's the blindness that they have chosen. That's the blindness that so many choose as well as we go out and we we, we continue. And there's many advancements in like archaeology and studies and, and all these things that are, are confirming the scriptures, confirming the word, that this, that this is something that happened, extra biblical sources dating back to when Christ walked the earth that said 
there's a resurrection. The Jews of that time had a completely, they completely switched from worshiping on the Sabbath day for, or from, from worshiping God to the first day of the week. They had a completely different religion change during the time that Christ was here because of the resurrection. And yet people will still be shown that evidence and see that and say, nah, <laughs> I don't want to believe it. I think it was all made up. I think that some of the, his, his disciples of that time must have wrote that and, and threw that little bit in. And they, they try, to, try to go against Scripture all the time, try to, to refute it, but they can't. <laughs> the consensus is, is that this is historic. There's too, it's, there, it, it's too, there's too much of it. The Scriptures are the, the most well-protected uh, documents that we have from those times. And there was so much of it written. There was in in comparison, you know, like I guess for trying to think of like a an unpopular book, um, I can't think of any. Probably like a history textbook, just like a regular textbook or something, a math one, versus like Harry Potter, <laughs> and how many books there were written about Harry Potter, versus you know just this other book here. And they would say, you know, and obviously this is this is you know fantasy fiction or whatever, but they would say, look at the comparison between how many manuscripts were written to catalog catalog these scriptures to catalog these and say, look look at how much that they did. They dedicated themselves to that. No other book has that happen. No other book has had that happen. And yet people still refuse to believe that. We choose blindness sometimes. And what about the parents, though? Whenever they're uh, asked about this, they're like, "Well, yeah, this. We we know this is our son. We we see, you know, we see him. We can identify our child. You know, how many parents wouldn't be able to identify their child, especially, uh, you know, when all of this is going on? You would think that they would be excited and they would be thrilled. And they'd be like, "This is amazing! Like you." All of the hardship that you had to endure your entire life and how he couldn't even work for himself. He was a beggar. And now he can he can get out and he can go out and, and, and work. He can do things now. He can see. They would, should have been celebrating with him. But they wanted to maintain a, a neutral stance to this because of their fear. Because they were afraid that the, the, the Pharisees would have kicked them out of the synagogue. And so they chose blindness to Christ because of their fear of being put out of the synagogue. They chose to be blind, and they pushed it further on to him. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12 and verse 30. What does Christ say? He says, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. What kind of a warning is that for us? You know, those that, that can see this and say, you know, I, I just don't want to take a stand for it. You know, I, I'm just going to remain neutral. I believe, in, I believe what happened, but I'm not going to let everybody else know. I'm not going to go out on a limb. I'm not going to risk my neck to you know to proclaim Christ. I'm not I'm not going to put my neck out there on the line. He's saying that if you don't if you're not for him, if you're not actively for him, you are against him. They chose to be blind in this situation. They chose to to not uh, proclaim the glory of of God because of Christ's miracle in this moment. What about today? Are there Christians that are not getting involved? Yeah, there are. And that's not a good thing. Finally, the, the third attitude toward Christ is that you know, he shared... The, the blind man, the one that had been blind, he shared this news with everyone that he encountered. 
And it wasn't just that he was sharing this news, but they also took notice of it too. They saw him and they recognized, hey, that's the beggar. That's the guy that's been blind since bo- he was born. And they, they saw that. And, and he affirmed that it was Jesus Christ, the one that was that had, that had was a prophet of God, had to be, because how else would he have been able to have been healed of his blindness? He wasn't afraid of what anyone else would say. He wasn't afraid of his fellow man and what they would think. He proclaimed him all the way to the point where they kicked him out. I mean, he was going up against the, the Pharisees there. He was pretty tongue-in-cheek. It was, I mean, imagine seeing that conversation happen, and they're just, just questioning him, just interrogating him. And he's like, why are you doing this? Do you want to be a follower of Christ too? I mean, that's really just laying it on him. And he suffered the consequences of his convictions. And he also enjoyed the reward of, of his convictions. Let's pick back up. I want to read the, the rest of this passage. It says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin, but now you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remains. Jesus heard what they had done to this man. This is a comforting thought. We should take note of this. They knew what happened to he knew what happened to this blind man, and he goes and finds him. They kicked him out of the synagogue. This man's life is really just beginning again. Beginning anew. He had he had the rest of his life ahead of him. He can see now. He can do so many things that he had not been able to do before. Imagine his excitement, and now he can't do any of those things because he's been accursed. He's been cast out, and people would have looked at him differently after that. People would not have been associating with him just like his parents were already pushing him out. But Jesus comes, and he is with him, and he comforts him. He finds him to do this. I think we need to find, uh, reflect on the times in our lives that if we stand up for Christ— and make him our dedication. That he'll, and we suffer consequences because of it. Now he'll comfort us. Seek him out. Seek that comfort as well. But we see that there was all these different attitudes towards this, this instant. I hope that this study a little bit, this, this little study has helped out a little bit. Because maybe we can look at these three different classes of of individuals and where do we fit in? You know, do we fit in with the Pharisees who whenever we're presented with evidence for something like this for Christ and we say, nah, I I can't, I can't see it. I'm choosing not to see it. Perhaps we're like his parents who whenever they were put to the test, they refused to stick their neck out. And they chose to be blind to it as well. Or we could be just like the one who was blind and go out and tell everyone that we encounter, Jesus has made a change in my life. And he can make a change in yours. Now's a good time to evaluate ourselves. Now's a good time to dedicate ourselves to God, dedicate ourselves to Christ, allow him to make those changes in our lives. If any need to be made, I'm sure that there are, I think, in everybody's lives, we can still continue to make changes in our life to be better stewards of the blessings that God has given to us, better uh, evangelists for Christ, have that passion about us whenever we're going out and talking with individuals day to day, pray that God is going to save one soul today. That was awesome today. We had, you know, that's, that's what we wanted, right? Somebody definitely prayed that. Because there was a soul that was saved today. And it's a good opportunity right there as well. But there's a a young man that has dedicated his life to Christ and can be encouraged now. And we could reach out to him and encourage him 
and say, hey, you're not alone in this fight. But what about ourselves? Do we need to make changes? Do you need to become baptized tonight? Do you need to ask for the forgiveness of sins? Do you need to ask for the prayers of the saints that we can join together with you and, and uplift you and, and encourage you in whatever situation you may be in? Now's the time to ask. Now's the time to, to act. Don't, don't put it off any longer. If you have any need of the gospel call, please come forward, take a seat on the front as we stand and sing the invitation song.